Uh, good evening. Uh, welcome to the uh, 2010 uh, William E. Boeing uh, Distinguished Lecture. Uh, I am Tom Shi. I'm head of the School of Aeronautics and Astronautics. It is my distinct uh, pleasure to, uh, to have all of you here tonight, uh, either here in uh, Fowler Hall or uh, watching at home. It is now my uh, distinct privilege to introduce the leader of our great university. Uh, she is a scientist and educator. Uh, she is a supporter of all things Purdue, a cheerleader for the Boilermakers uh, in the classroom, in the lab, uh, in our community, and on the playing field. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, and the president of Purdue University, uh, Dr. Franz Cordova. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Boilermakers, Boilermaker community members. Thank you for being here. And thanks to the College of Engineering and its School of Aeronautics and Astronautics and to the Indiana Space Grant Consortium for making this evening possible. As you know, Purdue has a long history in aerospace and a very close relationship with NASA. The school has produced more aerospace engineering degrees than any other U.S. university during the past decade. Go Boilers! And I'll ask the students here, how many Purdue graduates have been selected as astronauts? 23, that's right. <laughs> well, uh, including, of course, Neil Armstrong, the first person on the moon, and Gene Cernan, who prefers to be called the most recent person on the moon. Neil and Jean are very close to Purdue still, and they're quick to say that they were only two of thousands of engineers and scientists, many of them Purdue graduates, who helped us to get to the moon. Our association with NASA goes back to its earliest days. Purdue graduate Virgil Gus Grissom, remember Grissom Building on our campus, was one of the original Mercury 7 astronauts and the second American to fly in space. We have research partnerships with NASA, and our students are looking to the skies through an organization called the Students for the Exploration and Development of Space, open to all majors. How many of you here are members of that organization? Great, well, welcome here tonight. The space travelers, engineers, and scientists of tomorrow are studying at Purdue today. Tonight I'm honored to welcome to Purdue NASA Administrator and retired Marine Corps Major General Charles Bolden, Jr. Before arriving at NASA, General Bolden had a long and successful career in the military and in science. During his distinguished 34-year service with the Marine Corps, he flew more than 100 combat missions. His many military decorations include the Defense Superior Service Medal and the Distinguished Flying Cross. He's also a veteran of four shuttle missions and commanded two of them, logging more than 680 hours in space. His flights included deployment of the Hubble Space Telescope. I believe that was launched before the, most of the freshmen on our campus this month were born. And the first U.S.-Russian shuttle mission. He was inducted into the U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame in May of 2006. He graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy with a degree in electrical science and earned a Master of Science degree in systems management from USC. General Bolden is only the second astronaut to lead NASA in its 50-year history. Hearing from the leader of our space program is a rare opportunity for the campus and the community. NASA has been the doorway to our universe and one of the principal agencies for exploration and research. 
And as you know, this is a critical time in the agency's history. We all at Purdue have a great vision for space exploration, and I know some of our students are eager to get out there and to keep on exploring. So I know that you will give General Bolden a really warm welcome, a round of applause this evening as he gives his talk titled, Our Nation's Future in Space. It's my distinct honor to introduce NASA Administrator General Charles Bolden. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Um, Dr. Cordova, thank you so very much for those very kind words. And thanks to all of you for, uh, for coming out tonight. Uh, I want to thank the College of Engineering and the Indiana Space Grant Consortium for inviting me to speak to you tonight. And um, I want you to know it's quite a pleasure for me to be back here on the Purdue campus. I have, um, I have been here before on, on selected occasions, but it's been quite a while since I came back, and as I was explaining to people who came in with me from Washington, this is actually the first time that I have done more than fly a T-38 into the airport uh, here on campus, come see somebody, get back in my T-38, and go back to Houston. So uh, we actually spent most of the day here, and it's, it's been an incredible experience for me, and I, I really want to thank all of you, students, uh, faculty, everybody who really made us feel at home, uh, and from whom I've learned quite a bit today. Um, I really, you know, it's, it's just a pleasure to be here at one of our nation's great universities. And I, I want to, again, express my appreciation to you, uh, Dr. Franz Cordova, for uh, being Purdue's president, which um, I'm not sure how many of you understand the significance of having uh, a woman of such esteem as your president, having a woman uh, as the president of such a prestigious university. They are few and far between. Uh, when you look at places like this. Um, I am very proud to say that, uh, that Dr. Cordova and I are, are both alums of NASA. This is, I am returning for my second time, and she's actually the former NASA chief scientist. Uh, and I commend her for the shining example that, that um, she set for what can be accomplished in science, technology, engineering, and math, or STEM as we call it. Dr. Cordova, for those of you who may not know, was the first woman and the youngest person ever to hold the position of chief scientist at NASA. Another NASA alum here uh, tonight is a dear friend of mine, uh, Dr. Al Diaz, who was the, in fact, when I was at NASA, was kind of running the science mission directorate. I don't even know what we called it back then, Al. Didn't call it that, but we called it something. And then he went over to become the director of the Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, so it is, it's very special for me to be here with him. He's now Purdue's Executive Vice President for Business and Finance. I think many of you know that many of the astronauts count Purdue as their alma mater. <clears throat> From our first moonwalker, Neil Armstrong, to Mark Polanski, commander of last year's STS-127 space mission, uh, I count <clears throat> 22 plus 1, I have learned tonight, astronauts among the ranks of the Boilermakers. And it's plus 1 because one is still an astronaut candidate, I understand. So we have this funky thing, you know, about you're not an astronaut until you finish your first year or whatever it is, and don't ask me, but that's just the way it is. So you have 22 plus one. Um, this place, um, these halls on this campus have contributed an awful lot to the space program, and, and through that, the economic well-being of this nation, our national security, and yes, the spirit of our country through the vast inspiration that exploration provides. I love that you have a college of engineering, a college of science, and a college of technology. This is really my kind of place. Earlier today, I spoke to the interns from Purdue who spent their summer at NASA. Speaking to such students is one of the most rewarding things that I have an opportunity to do as the NASA administrator. Students who are just starting their college careers are generally excited about the future. They're fired up about what lies ahead for the space program and the chance to create capabilities that we don't have today. They want to be part of something larger and they want to contribute to national goals. We're often asked to justify the space program, which by the way, for those of you interested in trivia, 
is only about 0.6% of the entire federal budget, six-tenths of 1%. In light of so many other pressing world problems here on the ground, from poverty to disease and war, but the fact is that space exploration has made huge contributions to all of the problems we face as a planet. Technology like we use in our water processing systems on the International Space Station, or ISS, for instance, is helping people in remote areas get access to water. ISS research has helped us learn more about salmonella and has led to a candidate vaccine, and we're also studying other pathogens. Many of the tools and technologies we take for granted came about as a result of exploration. It's an impressive list that you can peruse if you care to go to our NASA website. But I want to emphasize how exploration improves life for people everywhere on Earth and helps us solve a lot of problems that are universal. You need only to look at the partnership between 15 nations, including a former Cold War rival, Russia that created the International Space Station to see how exploration brings our world together. I'm one of the still too small group of people who have witnessed our home planet from above, where we see no visible borders. I had the privilege of working with international crews, all focused on the same big goals and sharing our triumphs and successes as a team. I hope many more people have the chance to experience that in the years to come. I want that world for my grandchildren. Let me get back down to earth, though. I also spoke today to some fourth through sixth grade, fourth through fifth graders, actually. The sixth graders didn't show up. <laughs> That's not true. I don't think they were invited. <laughs> but in speaking to the fourth and fifth graders who were participating in the first robotics competition, um, you know, they were about real world challenges and they were asking some of the same questions our scientists and engineers do when they build a robot to send to space or to another planet. I think we really have to grab kids at this age. They have to be engaged at the earliest grades and make science, technology, engineering, and math studies a regular part of their curriculum so they don't seem alien, so they don't seem like huge, scary subjects. First, makes that tangible. It demonstrates a connection between the subjects they've been studying and real-world applications. At the high school level in the first program, when students are building real robots out of metal and gears and controllers, they basically have to do a complete mission turnaround in a very brief period, including completing a full engineering requirements analysis, brainstorming, developing a concept, then designing it and building it, developing the software and integrating everything, documenting their work, testing and debugging, and then their robot actually competes against others from around the world. The goal isn't simply to build a robot, but to provide a vehicle for learning much more, with an ultimate goal of building a collaborative team, a supportive community, and a solid strategy for problem solving during the competition. Here at Purdue, you, so, you uh, successfully have supported, I think, three or four teams in the first robotics program. NASA sponsored nearly 300 of the 1,800 teams that participated in the 2010 First Robotics International Competition held this summer in Atlanta, Georgia. Boeing and several other major corporations are also big sponsors. We plan to continue our involvement with this great program. But you know, I was asked to speak to you tonight about NASA's vision for the future of exploration. Our nation's leadership is still working out the details of the budget for next year, but a few things are clear. For those of you that don't understand, that means Congress is still working on the budget. Okay, so uh, when we finish, I'll come tell you again, but, but we're optimistic. The nation has established exploration as a priority. It wasn't that long ago that we had to justify why we were even pursuing human space flight at all as a nation. That's no longer in question. We will be doing human exploration, and we plan to develop the capabilities needed to go beyond low Earth orbit farther into our solar system. The discussion underway now will determine the path we take to achieve this future of new capabilities and a new way of looking at space. We're no longer discussing whether or not we should be pursuing exploration at all. That's a positive shift in the dialogue and a real testament to the accomplishments of NASA 
and the entire aerospace industry over the past decades. The President released his national space policy in June. It's part of a national focus involving many agencies. A major goal is to enlarge and reinvigorate American research and development. The policy brings focus to efforts needed today to enable a bright future with space as an even larger part of the nation's efforts. This policy will ensure the U.S. remains at the forefront of innovation. We're going to develop the capabilities that help our nation both in space and here on Earth. In doing so, we'll inspire these young and not so young and active, actively encourage students to dream and build and become the engineers and scientists of tomorrow. We've achieved amazing things already. We've landed robots on Mars, for instance, and they've roamed the Martian surface and sent amazing high-definition, high-resolution images of the red planet back to Earth. We've created and successfully launched the world's largest fleet of Earth-observing satellites that have provided insightful data about our climate, planet's climate, water levels, ice coverage, and so much more. We've launched to date 356 men and women into space on the space shuttle. But President Obama now wants us to focus on new and emerging capabilities we'll need to make huge leaps in the decades ahead. To take the necessary steps to develop and flight test new exploration systems. Several examples are propulsion systems that allow us to reach Mars much quicker than the current eight month trip, closed loop life support to make it feasible to live on another planetary body or just get there in the first place. Precision landers that can scout future destinations at the same time as they test technologies and make scientific discoveries. Strong research universities like Purdue will no doubt play a critical role in all of this work. There are many things in the plan for fiscal year 11 that seem to be certain, like extending the International Space Station to at least 2020, increasing support for many science missions, especially in Earth science, ramping up funding for the next generation of science and aeronautics research, and expanding our education activities to help us widen the pipeline for future leaders. One of the key things that is, that is that next generation of technology. There are technology capabilities experts in the field have agreed for years we need for long duration deep space missions. A new heavy lift rocket that can get us out into deep space seems likely to be one of our priorities, as well as some mix of the systems I mentioned earlier. We now have a new chief, science, chief technologist, Dr. Bobby Braun, one of our youngest NASA leaders at the age of 44, and he's helping guide our planning for technology development when the, when the fiscal year 11 budget is approved. There's an open letter to students from Bobby on the AIAA website. He makes a lot of good points and challenges today's students to become tomorrow's innovators. One of our immediate needs is to inspire the next generation and give them the hands-on opportunities to develop hardware and flight test it. When you think about it, it's not a long timeline for the students, many of you sitting in this auditorium, that we're attempting to inspire to be the scientists and engineers conducting these missions. Some of you who are sophomores today will only be 35 years of age by the time we reach an asteroid in 2025, as the president has proposed. Uh, believe it or not, that's still pretty early in your career. You'll be in your mid-40s by the time a manned mission to Mars takes place. I want you to have a chance to excel and create the world of tomorrow with its stunning possibilities, as was done by the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo generation, and the scientists and engineers who constructed and launched the Hubble Space Telescope. NASA's new direction has been widely reported as a cut, but it's not. It's a $6 billion increase over the next five years. That's a huge vote of confidence by the President and Congress in these tough economic times. We're working to enable commercial access to low Earth orbit, that area that extends to where Hubble and the space station are, 250 to 400 miles above us. With congressional approval, we're going to keep working with companies both large and small to open up this entirely new segment of the economy. Companies that can launch to space 
and the many businesses that provide things like communications and supporting equipment that we think will spur jobs and innovation for decades to come. Those are jobs that the students of today, that you will be able to pursue. The International Space Station that has been our focus for much of the past two decades is an absolute engineering marvel. I could truly never have imagined when I was a child that in my lifetime, we would have an orbiting facility the size of a football field with an international crew on it 24-7, 365, sometimes 364 days, you know. And we're going to have it for at least another decade. So there will be many opportunities for students and educators, researchers and industry to put experiments on it and outside of it and gather information in a way that's possible nowhere else. We're really thinking hard about where we want to be in a generation, not just in the next five years. To move beyond that vehicle-driven approach to think in broader terms about the capabilities we need in order to do a wider range of things and serve a wider range of people from other government users of space to our international partners, industry, academia, and you, the private citizen. You asked about vision. So please allow me to tell you what I envision for the future of space exploration in years to come as we pursue NASA's exciting goals. Let me talk just a little bit about human exploration, but also exploration by our amazing science missions that go out into the universe and also help us better understand our own planet. We also have an incredibly robust aeronautics program that will greatly improve the future of air travel. Over the coming decades, NASA is determined to work with people everywhere to achieve continued and expanded exploration of space with humans that will drive prosperity here on Earth through innovations and technologies not even imagined today. Through our exploration endeavors, we will expand our economic sphere, expand our minds through exciting scientific discoveries, and expand our imaginations by going to incredible new places in the solar system. In the upcoming decades, we truly hope to witness the first boots on Mars, fulfilling the dreams of generations who have come before. As our first astronauts shake the red soil from their boots, they will prove once and for all that humans are truly meant to explore. We may be able to detect the earliest forms of matter, galaxies, and stars in the universe with the James Webb Space Telescope. We'll be able to probe the event horizon of a supermassive black hole in another galaxy with the International X-ray Observatory. Through our astrophysics missions, we may be able to peer back to the very beginnings of our universe. In Earth science, NASA, with our international partners, has deployed and are maturing a global Earth observation system of systems. In the future, this system will enable routine extended weather forecasting and multi-year climate predictions on a regional basis. Future airplanes will be more efficient, less polluting, and quieter. They will use much lighter high temperature materials and structures and potentially hybrid electric propulsion systems. We're constantly working on ways for young people to get involved with NASA and hopefully pursue careers in our wonderful world. We recently announced a competition for high school students to participate in a program called Spheres in which they design software to program small soccer ball sized satellites aboard the International Space Station. These little satellites are used to test maneuvers for spacecraft performing autonomous rendezvous and docking. Three of them fly today inside the station's cabin, and they're each self-contained with power, propulsion, computing, and navigation equipment. How exciting to have worked on one of these when I was in school. Our Minority Innovations Challenges Institute is working to create a virtual training ground where minority undergraduate students learn how to compete in NASA technical challenges, sometimes for significant cash prizes. These activities will focus on competitions found within NASA's Centennial Challenges Program, which provides cash prizes from $50,000 to $2 million to individuals or teams that can achieve specific technical accomplishments. We're kicking off a one-stop shopping initiative 
where undergraduate and graduate students who want to apply for a NASA internship or fellowship soon will have access to all of NASA's opportunities on a single website. At an education summit next week, we're going to iron out some of the kinks and bring together people interested in participating and creating, creating even more opportunities. And we're also, we also want to develop ways to maintain the connection with these passionate young people who come to work for us and experience great learning opportunities. We want to stay in touch, see where their careers take them, and help them open doors at NASA if that's where they want to go. Among our current exciting science missions, epoxy, the repurposed deep impact spacecraft. Some of you will remember the one that carried the impactor that hit a comet a couple of years ago. Well, it reaches the comet Hartley II in November for extended examination of this mysterious object. Also in November, we'll launch a space shuttle with a robotic crew member, Robonaut 2, or R2, as we like to call him. R2 was developed through a Space Act agreement between General Motors and NASA to work in the auto industry and will now be tested for applications in space. In March next year, Miss Messenger will become the first spacecraft ever to orbit Mercury. The Mars Science Laboratory, dubbed Curiosity, launches in November 2011. It'll be the largest rover we've ever sent to the Red Planet, about the size of a small car, and it will carry its own laboratory as its name suggests. One of its prime goals will be to help us learn more about whether or not Mars has ever been hospitable to life. In 2014, we plan to launch the James Webb Space Telescope to a point a million miles away. It's hard to imagine that distance, but Webb is going to be the most advanced observatory we have, and it will peer back to the very beginnings of the universe. The New Horizons spacecraft reaches Pluto in 2015, and that mysterious dwarf planet will get its first thorough examination. In Earth science, new missions to study ice sheets and carbon cycles and climate change and many other processes of our planet are in development. As I mentioned earlier, we have many plans in aeronautics. Today, or tomorrow, I actually speak at a Green Aviation Summit in California. We're actively working with the FAA and others to develop the air transportation system of tomorrow, the next generation air transportation system or next gen. If you go to our website, you'll see some of the prototype vehicles that we're, we've solicited as a base for starting to develop some new aircraft on which we may all be traveling in the future. To do all this, as I've already said, we need the brightest American minds pursuing science, technology, engineering, and math. We need you. How we recruit you and other students around the country, how we get you and them interested and keep you and them interested at a young age is a huge challenge for us. We're going to need smart people in all disciplines, biologists, medical professionals, psychologists, geologists, material scientists. You name it in engineering and science, and we're going to have a need for it as we move out on the space missions for which we are laying the groundwork today. That 30-year grid is filling up fast. I know Purdue and our nation's other universities will continue to turn out graduates with skills and knowledge that you can apply for the betterment of our nation and our world. At NASA, we'll do our part to keep our vision big but achievable. I want you all to stay with us and stay on the cusp of imagination, wonder, and an insatiable quest for knowledge. Believe me, the best is yet to come. Thank you all so very much, and I think I'm gonna take some questions, if that's okay with the President. Bowden, thank you so much for sharing with us your vision for, uh, for our nation's space and also aeronautics. And I guess shortly we will have a uh, Q&A session. And, uh, and so please pass your questions to the center of the aisle and the students will pick them up. So if you have questions, maybe you can pass on to, to the center. 
and why these students are collecting questions, maybe I start with the first question. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> What do you see as the role for aerospace engineers, both aeronautics and astronautics, as having, uh, and, and also how, and for those who are engaged in aerospace engineering, how they should broaden their perspective so they can better serve our nations, both in space and, and, and aeronautics? As I mentioned in my comments, um, I, I think the future for a, an aeronautical engineer, any engineer, to be quite honest, is bright. Um, you know, if, if aero is not your thing, uh, and you're interested in mechanical engineering or electrical engineering, I'd say press. Uh, I happen to think they're the magical engineers because they're, the, they're sort of the universal engineers. Uh, if your interest is healthcare, uh, we need you. So I think you're going to find that the NASA of the future in trying to do the innovative things that we are, that we are endeavoring to do to answer the president's challenge uh, will need representation from each of you sitting here in the audience. And I, you know, I address my comments to, I kept using the term young. Uh, I consider myself young. Uh, it's in here, and it's in here, and it's in the way that you feel about things. So I think everyone in this audience is young or you would not be out here. And we have a place for every one of you, young minds, and we hope you'll stay interested in us. Are there any questions from the audience yet? Okay. Okay. How will we be working with our international partners beyond the International Space Station? Ooh. How do we work with our international partners beyond the International Space Station? Right now we have about 115 active international agreements that, are, that have nothing to do with the International Space Station. Many of them uh, are decades old. Uh, some started when Dr. Diaz was there. But we, uh, most of our international agreements are in the area of earth science. Uh, we find that most other nations uh, seek to do things in the science arena, in the earth science arena, that have what they call, that fulfill what they call societal needs. Uh, we, NASA has a program, for example, called Servir. Uh, it now, it's headquartered out of the Marshall Space Flight Center in the University of Alabama Huntsville, where we take 30 years worth of archived uh, earth science data uh, along with contemporary data that's coming down every day from a series of Earth science satellites. And we feed it to two places around the world. One is in, um, in uh, Nairobi, Kenya. The other one is in Panama. And we provide it to the countries of Central and South America and to 15 East African nations to help their leaders with disaster management, uh, with water resource management, crop planning and control. And we're even today uh, helping them to to design models to deal with flooding as well as droughts. Uh, when I leave the country in a few weeks, I'll actually be stopping through a place uh, in, um, near India where we're going to open the third um, site for Severe where we'll actually touch that part of the world with, uh, with the same program. So uh, our international cooperation spans the gamut from uh, space exploration all the way through to education. What advice do you have for non-science or non-engineering people to become a part of NASA? Ooh, hang in there with us, come work with us. Um, my, number one, my number one partner every morning is my attorney. <laughs> <laughs> I know I, I, kid it, I kid around all the time. Um, I have a general counsel. I have an office of general counsel and right now I think we have 30 attorneys at NASA headquarters and then each NASA, each of the the, the nine NASA centers in the Jet Propulsion Labs has an office that has the general counsel. We deal with everything from contracts, uh, contractual disputes, uh, environmental issues. We are presently involved with a big issue with the state of California, for example, uh, on cleanup issues, uh, labor relations, you name it. So that's an example. If you happen to be a person, I think I talked to somebody today uh, who was in, um, uh, Oh, I call it hotelry, uh, but it's, it's, you know, running hotels and managing facilities like that. Um, every time an astronaut get re gets ready to go fly in space, several months before we fly, we meet with the dietitians who are all NASA personnel. They help us decide what it is we want to eat for seven days or six months or however long you're going to be in space. Uh, you make up your menu in, co in coordination with them. They take a look at it and say, ah, need more calories. Uh, they never say you need less. They always say need more calories, need some manganese, 
some uh, potassium, all this other kind of stuff. So uh, dietitians play a critical role in space flight. Um, administrative personnel. My coming here, somebody had to do all the ticketing and everything else. We don't go outside. All that work is done by NASA employees. So you name it. If, as I mentioned in my comments, if there is an honorable profession, okay, if there is an honorable profession, we can use you. I even, I'm looking for a chaplain for NASA. So I need him or her. Other than being a, an astronaut, what other experiences helped you prepare to be the NASA administrator? Um, I think two things more than anything else prepared me to be the NASA administrator. Having the greatest set of parents in the world, my mom and dad, who are my role models and my uh, idols and look down on us tonight. Um, they taught me three things. They taught me that I had to study really hard uh, if I ever wanted to achieve anything. That I had to be willing to work really hard. You know, just, just get in there and grind it out. And then probably most importantly, to never be afraid of failure. Uh, to never let anybody tell me what I couldn't do. Uh, I grew up in the segregated South. I grew up in Columbia, South Carolina. In the, I was born in 1946. For those of you who are trying to figure it out, I'm 60. 364, somewhere in that neighborhood. <laughs> at, at my stage, it gets foggy. Um, but I watched my mom and dad work as teachers. They, they were career, I mean, career teachers and educators, and they worked uh, because they loved it. Um, they got up every morning just, just raring to go out and, and teach and help young people. And um, they inspired me, but they taught me that I just could not be a teacher because I couldn't work that hard for that little money. Um, and then I think the second thing that, that more than prepared me to be the NASA administrator was my 34 years in the Marine Corps. Um, I don't know whether there are any Marines in the audience or any uh, sailors, soldiers, airmen, Coast Guardsmen, if you are. Uh, I give you my heartfelt thanks uh, for what you do or what you have done. Veterans, um, um, you know, you, you serve. You didn't have to do what you did. And that's really important for this nation. Um, the things that I learned in my time in the Marine Corps uh, have just equipped me incredibly well. I tell everybody at NASA, people sitting here on the front row from NASA know that I'm uh, unabashedly unashamed of uh, saying that I am privileged to, to try to lead the second greatest group of people in the world. Uh, all of our NASA employees, second only to United States Marines. So uh, <laughs> that's kind of what helped prepare me. What is the current status of the Orion Project and the Ares Project, and what do you expect from these in the future? Orion and Ares, what the, what's the current status of Orion and Ares? Orion and Ares are two components of a program that was called Constellation, or that is called Constellation. And you need to, you know, I talked about politics uh, and Washington. Let me tell you the, the, the facts of life, okay? Right now, because we are still operating under the 2010 uh, Appropriations Act. That the you know that's how that's my budget. So I am required by law to continue to maintain and work on the Constellation program. Although President Obama and I decided that that was not the program for NASA going forward. Uh, so what we are trying to do is continue to work as much as we can to gain as many benefits from the Constellation program, Aries and Orion to learn as much as we can from it. We did uh, a test called Ares 1X, where we launched for the first time in decades a brand new rocket. Uh, Ares 1 would have been the, the uh, human carrying rocket, looks like a stick. Uh, it's a five segmented solid, or it was to have been a five segmented solid rocket booster. Um, Orion is the crew module that was to go with that program. We are looking to see what we can do to utilize uh, the contracts that we have with those programs, to utilize what we've learned from those, those particular programs to carry them on as we go to deep space. So uh, those continu we continue to work on those programs until the end of this fiscal year, until we get a new 2011 budget. The 2011 budget will allow us, uh, hopefully, to move on into trying to get beyond low Earth orbit, to bring on commercial enterprises, um, your president and I talked a little bit earlier tonight about her interest in particular and, and several other people in the School of Engineering, interest in understanding what it is that we need from the commercial sector uh, in terms of access to low Earth orbit. I always tell people when you go to space, there are two things that I look at. I look at access. That's how do you get there? Uh, NASA knows how to get to low Earth orbit. 
we've demonstrated that to lots of people. We have an incredible capability within the United States in, in commercial entities who have built rockets for us since time began. It has always been a commercial enterprise. The way we procured them has been different. We have always, they've always been built as a part of a NASA project and then we took them on and owned them and operated them. That's really expensive. And it has kept us from being able to do the types of exploration that we really want to and need to do for the nation and the world. And so we're gonna go into a different uh, procurement model, if you will, where we're gonna let the commercial enterprises continue to produce rockets. We're gonna rent them or lease them or whatever is necessary. When I need a rocket, if I wanna send astronauts to low Earth orbit to the International Space Station, I'm kidding here when I say I'm gonna get on the phone, but it'll, essentially I'll get on the phone and I'll call a commercial entity and I'll say, okay, I need a rocket in six months because I've got a crew of four that I want to send to the International Space Station. And um, we, we have not decided exactly how we want to run the, the operation, whether we train the crew and we can completely control the launch and, and the recovery and everything, or whether we let them do it. But that's the way that's going to go. And we're going to spend your money, the taxpayers' money, uh, primarily devoted to building a heavy lift launch vehicle with a vehicle like Orion that will take humans from low Earth orbit uh, back to the moon, on to uh, asteroids and near-Earth objects, and then on farther into deep space, deep space and eventually um, to a place we call Mars. So going along with that, what is the biggest obstacle in going to Mars? Two biggest obstacles, actually. Uh, the number one obstacle for me, because I'm the person that's got to say people can get on the rocket and go, is radiation. The, we, don't, we don't fully comprehend yet uh, what the full threat from radiation outside of low Earth orbit is. We do know that it poses a significant threat to, to human safety. Um, you know, humans can probably survive the trip to Mars uh, in the current environment, in current vehicles, but we think that there may be damage to the central nervous system. Uh, you know, they may reach their destination incapable of doing what, what it is we sent them to do. So radiation is the number one thing. We can build bigger shields, but that's weight. And weight is just, that's the worst enemy of exploration. You gotta, you know, we live in this gravity well called Earth. And uh, the heavier you are, the more power it takes to leave the gravity well. So we want lightweight vehicles. That means as little shielding as possible. Um, some medical people believe that there are prophylactic ways that you can treat someone so that the body will take radiation and it won't be damaged the way that it is today. I'm not sure that that's uh, the best way to do it, but we just don't know. So radiation is the number one. Second biggest challenge is in space propulsion and its speed. Uh, any fighter pilots in here or, or would be fighter pilots or sons and daughters of fighter pilots? OK, uh, there is the say I'm not a fighter pilot. Uh, I'm a marine attack pilot. Used to be. But uh, there is a saying in the fighter community that speed is life. And when you're going from low Earth orbit to another planet, speed is life. If we can reduce the time of transit from Earth to Mars from eight months to, say, half that, uh, that's half the exposure to radiation. And that may be enough that, you know, with current technologies, we can safely send humans there and bring them back. We don't know that. But in-space propulsion is probably our next greatest challenge. So the, those are the two big things. Different track. OK. Do you think the privatization of space will have any benefits beyond financial? I'm not sure they'll have fin The question was, do I think the privatization of space, and, and I would not characterize it as the privatization of space. What we are going to do is introduce commercial activities for access to low Earth orbit. And I, I, I didn't finish my whole statement before. I said there are two things when I talk about space exploration. There's access. How do you get humans into space? How do you get them to low Earth orbit? Because no matter what you're going to do, you start in low Earth orbit. Uh, you know, you can put humans in low Earth orbit on the International Space Station, or you can put them going around Earth in a spacecraft, and then you can either do an Earth orbit rendezvous or a rendezvous on the way to where you're going, but you got to get them there in the first place. And then the transit from low Earth orbit to wherever else it is that you want to go, that's exploration. There you're doing stuff we, other than going to the moon, uh, six times, 12 human beings setting foot on that planet, all of whom happen to be Americans, by the way. 
Uh, and that's not a trick question. Uh, I, I should have I asked the question. I love asking very learned groups. Okay, how many people walked on the moon? Everybody gets the answer right. How many? Twelve. And then the second question is, how many countries are represented in that 12 groups of people, group of people who walked on the moon? And you would be surprised at the answers that you get in very learned groups. Everything from 12 to six, four, three. And then I say, how about one? You know, there's only been one nation. That, that's right, that, that deserves a whoo. I mean, you, we should all be proud of that. And I'm, whether you're an American or not sitting in this audience, it is something about which we should be incredibly proud. Uh, that was hard. Some of you think it was easy. And some of you think going to space is easy because we, I have to admit, we make it look easy. It is not easy going to space. That is incredibly difficult. You know, getting off this planet is hard. And it will continue to be difficult. But we're going to utilize the commercial entities to provide access so that we can spend the taxpayers' money in doing the exploration, which is going beyond. So I'm comfortable with the commercial enterprise providing the access. And it, I don't view it as privatization. Uh, if it works well, somebody will make money. That's, you know, that's what they call capitalism. And that's why they call it commercial. And it's commercial because those entities put their own assets into it uh, with some investment on the part of the United States. And we've always done it that way. Uh, we don't do it quite as much as other nations, but we have always done it that way. We put some money up, some seed money, and then they use that to help with development. And then they go make money. Some of you, how many of you are in the stock market? Come on, come on. I know. And it's not doing as well as you'd like, probably. But how many of you are in the stock market again? How many of you have stock in a company like Boeing or Lockheed Martin or I don't think SpaceX is public yet. No. But, you know, when they provide transportation access for us to go to space, to the to the International Space Station, some of you are going to make money. And that's the whole concept. That's I am told by my friends who are economists and all this stuff that that's the engine of our, you know, our society. It's commerce and it's capitalism. So don't forget that. That's what kind of separate. Sometimes we're not as good as some of the other countries that claim that that's evil, you know, but that's what we do. So going back to the speed, uh, speed vein, what new technologies are being studied for faster space travel? Oh, what new technologies are being studied? Uh, we look at things such as um, ion engines, uh, a, an area that we, the United States, don't look at right now because you all are averse to it is nuclear propulsion. Uh, almost every one of our international partners is interested in getting into nuclear propulsion. When we talk about international cooperation, um, I, you, some of you may have heard me speak or you may have read something that I said, we are going to put our international partners in the critical path. What that means is as we develop new systems, we're going to look at an international partner and we're going to say, what do you bring to the party? And they're going to say, we want to do a, a nuclear engine to go from low Earth orbit to Mars. And I'm going to say, hmm, we can't do that. You know, because right now we just have chosen that we don't want to do that in our nation. If you can do it, then that's your contribution. You know, you put up the money, you develop it and we'll use it. So nuclear engines, plasma fusion, uh, I have a friend named Dr. Franklin Chang Diaz who has an engine called a Vasimer engine um, that's being developed both in Costa Rica, his home country, and, and down in Houston, Texas. And it's a constantly accelerating engine that theoretically can get you to, to Mars in, in a matter of a few months, not the eight months that we talked about before. So those are a couple. Um, yeah. Okay, back to Constellation. Um, what you already hit on this a little bit, but what do you believe was lacking in Constellation, holes or gaps that you oh, think yeah. might be uh, fixed or changed in a future program? Okay. If I look at Constellation, how many of you know what Constellation is, have heard the term before? Um, 
when, when Constellation came about, everybody know how it started, a part of the vision for space exploration in the Bush administration? Constellation um, was an incredible concept. The vision for space exploration, uh, I think, was really good. And it said, we are going to go beyond low Earth orbit. We're going to explore vast reaches of the universe. We're going to use, and the system that NASA chose to develop was called Constellation. And as it started out, it was going to be two spacecraft for all intents and purposes. One stick like Ares-1 that was going to take us to low Earth orbit, to the International Space Station and to low Earth orbit where we could then rendezvous with and get on a vehicle that would take us to Mars. Uh, cargo and other things would be launched on a big heavy lift launch vehicle that would take the things like rovers and, uh, and other uh, surface systems that we would need to work at Mars. Through the years from the inception of the, the um, visions for, for space exploration, a strange thing happened, which is not unusual in our country. Uh, neither the Congress nor the administration chose to fund it. And so each year we decided, and, and, and I, um, you know, as a, as a taxpayer, someone who could have talked to my congressman, I'm just as guilty, because I watched as they said, okay, we're, we're not really going to give you the money that you need to do this. And so each year, NASA made the conscious decision to, okay, we'll delay this or we'll defer that. And when I became the NASA administrator, the vision for space exploration and the Constellation program was a lunar focused program with no surface systems, um, struggling to get um, the, the Ares-1 rocket ready to take humans to low Earth orbit uh, with a crew vehicle that used um, technologies from, you know, not today, but some time ago, and no vision, no possibility that we were going to reach Mars or Neo or anything else other than maybe the moon in, in my lifetime. And then when we got to lunar orbit, no way to get to the surface because we, we had taken the money away from the descent system. Uh, we had taken all the money away from the surface systems. So we would be able to orbit the moon, but we wouldn't be able to do anything when we got there. And so, um, you know, my conversations with the president, it just didn't seem like it was a smart thing to continue to pursue, to continue to hope that we could make this thing work out. Um, one of the things I think you will see as we struggle to come to grips with the budget for the coming year and the succeeding years is that we're going to have to make very difficult choices uh, as to just how do we phase the systems that take us beyond low Earth orbit. You can't do everything at once. So you'll decide, okay, should we start working on a heavy lift launch vehicle first? Uh, let the technology come along that will make the crew vehicle itself um, something new and exciting. Uh, do, we, do we begin to work on the crew vehicle and stop part of the way along, then begin to work on the heavy lift launch vehicle so that when both have reached the technological maturity that we want, we marry them together and we boom, go on off to Mars and other places. Those are decisions that we agonize over right now and, and they are, um, it's frustrating to people sometimes, but we really have got to find new and innovative ways to do the things we want to do. And that's um, to people who like to go do it now, uh, we're not doing it now. We're trying to do it right. And we're trying to do it so that it, I tell people it's got to be three things. It's got to be affordable, which means I get a $19 billion budget. And uh, I have promised people that I am not going to touch science. I am not going to touch money for aeronautics. Um, I'm going to find money for technolog technology development and education. And then whatever's left over is what we're going to use for exploration. Uh, and then we've still got to carve out some to, to sustain the International Space Station through 2020 or so. Uh, so it's got to be affordable. It's got to be sustainable. What does that mean? It has to survive over multiple administrations and multiple Congresses, uh, or, or else why start it? There are several ways that I think you do that. The International Space Station is perhaps the best example of how you make something sustainable. You put internationals into the critical path so that it is no longer yours, and you can't just unilaterally decide that, okay, it's gone. Uh, when the Augustine Committee first met, um, they said that they were unanimous in their opinion that we should terminate the International Space Station in 2016. And then the international partners started coming in one by one. And they all insisted that you cannot do that. That we have put 10 years worth of treasure and uh, sweat and everything into developing the system. We now are ready to start doing science and you just cannot let it go. 
And it was the international partners that convinced uh, the Augustine Committee to recommend to the president, the president then in Congress to say, okay, we're, we, we're good with that. Let's, let's, let's us agree to extend the life of the International Space Station to at least 2020. And we're in the process now of certifying it so that we can fly it to 2028 should the, should the member nations decide. But it's not a unilateral decision on the part of the United States. We have five partners, the United States, the European Space Agency, uh, Japan, um, Canada, and who did I forget? Russia. Russia. Oh, Russia. <laughs> Holy jamoli. How could I forget Russia? But every single partner has to say we're on board. Russia has said they're on board. We were just notified by the Japanese last week that they're on board. The United States is on board, so we're waiting for the European Space Agency, but they assure us that they're coming, and Canada has to say that. So I think that's critical um, to, the, to the sustainment part. And then the final thing is it has to be realistic. You know, it has to be attainable. Uh, it cannot be a pipe dream. We have, this nation has lived with pipe dreams for far too long. When I came to NASA in 1980, uh, I never dreamed of being an astronaut. I'll, I'll admit that. I never dreamed of being an astronaut. I kind of stumbled in through it. Um, but when I finally came to be an astronaut, I thought I would fly on the shuttle a couple of times and then I'd be off training to go to the moon and I would, I would be among the first Americans to return to the surface of the moon. I'd visit there a couple of times and then go on to Mars. I really thought that. I honestly did. And, and I think we probably would have been well on the way had we not lost Challenger in 1986. There, some of you who are old enough to remember that, uh, it was traumatic for the nation, traumatic for the world, and it just kind of stopped us in our tracks for a couple of decades, to be quite honest. Um, so it's got to be something that is realistic. And those three things are critical. And I think we're going to do that. I apologize for the long answer. Yeah. Um, how will NASA use technology to help the environment, especially with the BP oil spill? Um, I, you use it. How do we use technology to help the environment? We have something called the A-Train. Al, you may have to help me explain this. Uh, the A-Train, not a train really, but it's a series of six satellites now. I, it's not important how many. <laughs> I, didn't want to put, I didn't want to put Dr. Diaz on the right. spot, you know, five or six. But they are Earth orbiting satellites that are, we call it the A-train because they're in the same, relatively the same orbit, and they go around Earth 16 times every normal Earth day, and so they get three looks at every piece of Earth as they travel, one straight down, one from here, and one from here, as their orbit precesses. Um, yeah, you're still counting, huh? Yeah, yeah I think it's six. But, but the, in, the, the instruments aboard the satellites in the A-train, when uh, the earth, earthquake struck Haiti, instantly we had images coming to the ground, going to the rescue workers in Haiti. Uh, that very first day, we imaged three landslides west of Port-au-Prince that it probably would have been weeks, if not months, for people to discover, you know, we're there, probably with people buried beneath it. So we were able to get that down real time. Um, with the Gulf oil spill, instantly, uh, we had imagery coming down from several of the satellites in the A-train that characterized the oil spill. Said, okay, this is how big it is. It's moving this way or it's not moving. Um, you know, the, the one thing that we can't do because we just don't have the ability to look beneath the surface of the water from space just yet, not controlling, controlled anyway. Um, we could not tell the depth of the spill. That would have been the missing piece. If we, people who talked about the plume underwater, it would have been great if we had an instrument that could do that, but, but we just don't. But that's NASA technology. It's, it's NASA, NOAA, Department of Defense. It's the U.S. government's technology from space, Earth imaging technology that allow us to do things like help with a Gulf oil spill. Uh, Hurricane, help me here. Katrina? Uh, Katrina? No, 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 that just went zipping up the East Coast. <laughs> Earl! Uh, we sent, for the first time ever, uh, NASA sent two aircraft into Earl. One was actually over Earl. It was a, uh, an, unmanned, an unmanned aerial system, a Global Hawk. Uh, that had a number of instruments on board that imaged Earl from above, uh, had a DC-8 for all intents and purposes that went through the eye wall, uh, several pass, pa passes in and out of the hurricane, getting data to pass to the National Weather Service, 
the National Hurricane Center and all that kind of stuff, uh, giving them real-time data so we knew how, what track Earl was most likely going to follow. And I mean, it was incredibly accurate, the forecast, and it's because we now, NASA assets, can go inside hurricanes, can go above hurricanes, and can help provide real-time data to scientists who can make predictions and forecasts and all that. So just a couple of, couple of examples. Okay. Now that we're um, nearing the completion of the assembly phase of Space Station, what do we hope to gain with the next 10 plus years of science and research on Space Station? What do we hope to gain with the next 10 plus years? One of the first things that we're hoping to do is uh, privatize is not the right word. We want to establish, how many of you are familiar with the Hubble Space Telescope and the Space Telescope Science Institute it, on the campus of Johns Hopkins? NASA does not control the Hubble Space Telescope. You know, we took it to orbit, and after checkout and everything, we handed it off to the, to the Hubble Space Telescope Science Institute, which is a non-governmental, I think it's non-governmental, non-governmental organization. And they, they get requests for time on Hubble, they schedule it, they, they, they give it to people. We want to do the same thing with the International Space Station. We want to, we want to stand up a non-governmental organization that will conduct peer reviews of experiments that people say they want to fly aboard the International Space Station. We want to ensure that we have good science. Uh, we have established a relatively good track record of putting good science on ISS, and we want to enhance that. We want to make it even better. We have a lot of underutilized capability on the International Space Station, so we need commercial entities, universities, international partners, other government agencies. We need to get them to utilize what we, the capabilities that we have on station. So we really believe that uh, over the next 10 years, you're going to see incredible scientific advantages and, and advancements come from the International Space Station. I mentioned salmonella. You know salmonella, like the virus, the bad stuff, bacteria? Um, serendipitously, big word. Okay. <laughs> By accident. Um, we were studying uh, bacteria and trying to find what effect microgravity had on, uh, on various forms of bacteria. Um, we found that in most cases uh, it is not good because phew, they just explode. And in one of those experiments, we went in, and, or we, the researchers went in, and they found that they could actually separate out uh, some, of the, some of the bacteria that were related to the salmonella uh, disease. And we now, they have developed a potential vaccine uh, against salmonella. So those kinds of things in terms of medical research, biomedical research. Um, I was talking with some of your uh, staff and students here today about some of the experiments that you all are doing, um, and somebody yell it out because I will get it wrong. But it's, uh, it's biological, help me. Remember we were talking about um, measuring the effects of gravity on on biosystems, on cellular stuff? Biomems. Bio, Biomems. Biomems technology. Um, going back to radiation, I asked the question, I said, okay, if, you, if gravity, if you can measure the effect that gravity has on the cells in the body and functions in the human body, can we do that with radiation? Because if I can find alternative ways to actually doing animal tests or things like that, um, it makes my life much easier to put it mildly. So uh, things that you're doing here at Purdue have direct application to what we need to find out uh, to advance our ability to go into deep space. Uh, whether it's biomedical engineering, biomedical science, uh, physics, propulsion, uh, you name it. You're doing some incredible stuff here. It's really exciting. Well, thank you for your time. We really appreciate you being willing to do a question and answer. So if we could have one more round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll leave, but I'll say two things. I really do want to thank, uh, thank you, President Cordova, for, um, for the hospitality today. Uh, it's been a hectic day for, for us who came in from Houston, from Houston, from Washington. See what a hectic day it's been? Uh, but it's been an incredible, um, insightful, and inspirational day for us to have an opportunity to meet the students, the faculty, uh, the kids that you all reach from the local schools through the FIRST program. Uh, and, and what I would tell you is what my mom and dad told me. 
study really hard while you're here. You know, really put yourself into what you're doing. You have inc an incredible opportunity at one of the world's foremost universities. So take advantage of it. Um, enjoy yourselves while you're here. Uh, because you're also at one of the best universities to party. Uh, I know the president probably doesn't like that, but I, you know, that's all right. And, um, and then finally, as I said before, don't be afraid of failure. Um, set goals for yourselves, believe in yourselves, and just go do what you know you can do. So I'll, I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you so much. Again, I guess General Bowden left the uh, stage, but again, I again want to thank General Bowden for sharing his vision and his plan for NASA and also his wonderful advice and answering all the questions from the audience. But to this audience, I thank you so much for participating and wish you a very wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Thank you.